Welcome to A Place for Film, the IU Cinema Podcast. On this week's episode, we are live at the cinema. Yes, there we go. All right, thank you guys so much for sticking around. Um, From Here to Eternity, excellent film, right? Um, The the 50s have always been like one of my favorite eras of, of Hollywood film, and this one is sort of non-Hollywood, but let's talk first of all about what they changed from the book, because there were a couple of big changes that uh, were forced upon uh, the directors. The first one uh, was the Maggio character. In the book, the scenes of him getting beaten up were really, really explicit, Um, uh, and they cut those out, so you just hear about them secondhand. The other one, which was tougher for the the filmmakers to swallow, was the... um, uh, uh, the, the, the major, the captain at the end, at the end of the book, he actually gets promoted to major. Um, the army would not allow, would not uh, give them cooperation if they, uh, if they uh, had that in there. Although I forgot something very important. We didn't introduce ourselves. No. Um, <laughs> my name is Andy Hunsucker. And I'm Jason Thompson. And with us this week is Craig Simpson uh, from the Lilly Library, who's going to chat with us about the film, and I hope you guys will join in as well. Um, so let's talk about favorite moments real quick. Um, and I guess I will start. Uh, there was just this little moment that I noticed where after uh, Pruitt plays taps for Maggio, he like hands the bugle back to the, the guy, the, the normal bugler, and the guy looks at it like, it can do that? <laughs> <laughs> he just had this look of wonder on his face. Jason, what about you? One of my it, my favorite moment comes later in the movie, when the soldier is running, basically saying it's you know the Japanese, and essentially you see the plane coming right at the camera, mm-hmm. and the soldier is running yeah. straight at the camera, and that's what something uh, the the director was known for is just doing practical things on like actual locations, and this is a perfect example of that where the bullets just come right at the camera. You know, I would not want to be that cameraman. Yeah. Because they're just coming, just like lines of them. And on the big screen, that was just even more intense. And I got, you know, the same, like, oh. And then, and then I noticed they do that multiple times. You know, when they go up the ladder and yeah. they come out on the roof and then there they are again. It's just, I, I really like that. I really, especially for a film in the 50s, to do something like that. Of course, the director, you know, um, was it Fred Zimmerman? Uh, yeah. Zimmerman, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Goes to do that later in many of his other films. So it was something that, it was sort of his signature. Yeah. And in this movie in particular, it's, I feel like, taken to the extreme. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Craig? Yeah, uh, I think that same scene you mentioned, which uh, incidentally the soldier who was running is uh, better known, became better known as a screenwriter, Alvin Sargent, who wrote uh, Spider-Man 2. Incidentally, <laughs> and uh, Julia, and has had a long established career. So that yeah. th- that was his uh, his his intro nice. to yeah. films. And then the other scene I really like is um, the first time Montgomery Clift plays the bugle in the bar, even though he's yeah. he's dubbed. Uh, that's just kind of like a great scene. One critic called it he's playing like a fanfare to himself, and that's a yeah. that's a great scene too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, one of the things I read about the film was that uh, the the character, I, the idea for Montgomery Cliff's character was that. He, uh, he wasn't able to express himself unless he was playing the bugle. Mm. So that was really important. And, and Montgomery Clift, he learned how to play the bugle. He learned how to play pool. He learned how to box. The only thing that's actually him in the movie is playing pool. Uh, the boxing scenes are all doubled because they decided he wasn't good enough. And I guess the bugling didn't quite make it as well. But I heard that after I read that after the film, he carried that bugle around for weeks <laughs> and months. Uh, it never left his side because uh, much to the chagrin of all the people around him, because mm-hmm. from what I've read, Montgomery Clift could be quite obnoxious. <laughs> That's just what I heard. Um, anyone out in the crowd, favorite moments? Anyone have a favorite moment they want to share? No? Okay, we'll, we'll come back. Oh, I got one. I got, I got a couple right here. Let's, let's go to Chris here in the center, and then we'll, we'll go to this, this lady here. I finally have context for the beach scene. <laughs> yes. you described earlier. And it's interesting how it, there's a quick reversal. You know, just, just a minute or two after that scene, you think, yeah. 
you know, from the, the teasers or trailers or just, you know, that scene being in popular culture that, oh, it's a beautiful love. It's, well, it's a little this more is, complex. Yeah, right. this, is, this is the climax of their love, and they'll never be apart ever again after this. But, yeah, I, I, I had that same reaction when I first saw it. It was like, that's the result of that scene? That's the thing that we've been watching all these years? And, like, yeah, that's, that's, that, that fascinated me as well. And uh, Jason's favorite scene would have been awesome in 3D. <laughs> you do have a good point there. Yeah. Did you want to share real quick? My favorite scene tonight was when he played um, the jazz on his mouthpiece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought Just... that, was, that was excellent. I saw this when I was a kid. Oh, and wow. And the, the two scenes that I remember the most vividly are... Uh, the beach scene, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody remembers that. But also, when Frank Sinatra's um, character was dying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But th uh, those were very vivid to me from seeing it all those years ago. Yeah. And what year was this? 53. 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's one thing about sort of that, that death scene that always gets me is the guy in the Jeep, I always think, is fatso. Because yeah. the actors look so much alike. So the first time I watched the movie, I got really confused. And this was, you know, many years ago myself. And, and it wasn't really, and, and even tonight, I was just like, that's, oh, that's not him. It's the guy with the candy bar. It just, yeah. I, I don't know if they maybe did themselves a disservice by casting somebody that looked I know. kind of alike. Yeah, and I thought, the second time I saw the movie, I was like, did, when, when we first saw that guy in the supply depot, and he's eating the candy bar, and I'm like, did I miss something like big? Right. Is is that like his second job? Is that what he's doing? Right. <laughs> they say if you want to win an Oscar, you need to either have a drunk scene, a fight scene, or a death scene. And Sinatra has all three. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And of yeah. course, later on, he he was noted as saying as that he actually thought he deserved to win an Oscar for the Man with the Golden Arm oh, more so yeah. than this movie. Yeah. But it's hard to argue. You know, he's yeah. great in both movies. Yeah. Uh, so. Acting Oscars that this film was nominated for, uh, Lancaster and Clift were both nominated, neither of them won. Uh, Donna Reed uh, was nominated and won, and uh, Sinatra was nominated and won. Mm -hmm. uh, Deborah it's, Carr. Deborah, Deborah Carr, Carr was yeah. also, yes, yeah. she did not win either. Um, but it's interesting that, that uh, Clift and Lancaster were both nominated, uh, and who, did you, do you have it written down, Jason, who won that year? For? For Best Actor. I think it was something. It was like Stalag Seventeen was the uh, film. William Holden. William Holden, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I've never seen that film. I don't know, but yeah. it almost makes me wonder if maybe they split votes. They probably uh, did. They, they did, yeah. 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 And um, Audrey Hepburn won for *Roman Holiday* for Best Actress. Yeah, and she beat out Deborah Carr. But yeah, yeah. it was interesting. I, I was looking at those today, and it was interesting seeing it, it won. I mean, this film won what like eight, eight Oscars yeah. out of thirteen. Out of thirteen nominations, so it was really like the 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 picture of the year. Um, well, what's really funny is that, of course, it won for, I kind of did the same thing myself, and it won for cinematography. And of course, I lo had to, you know, I had to look up who is winning awards. Like, oh, what else are they known for? And it looks like Bennett Guffey is the guy's name. Wasn't his, wasn't his only Eternity movie, a, a, a movie with a, you know, Eternity in the title. Apparently he went on to do Edge of Eternity, as well as Hell to Eternity. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was kind of ironic. Did he win Oscars for either of those? I didn't look that up. I okay. didn't go that far with it. <laughs> but it was also in very interesting is that up until, I had it written down, up until 1968, there were awards for art direction, cinematography, and costume design, both in color and black and white. Yeah. So a lot of movies got sort of split down the middle with those as well. Mm -hmm. So they kind of split the difference on a few, like, okay, we'll give you this Oscar, we'll give you that Oscar because for cinematography I believe Shane won because it was in color mm -hmm. so yeah. I thought that was very interesting that up until you know the f I think it was the 40th Oscars they did that yeah for multiple things because obviously films were still being shown and released actively in black and white up until that time yeah um, let's talk a little bit more about the cast because the uh, the casting was not a no-brainer at least not to everyone so Montgomery Clift just barely made it into the film. Um, the original choice was Aldo Ray, who was not a really famous person. He was a contract player, 
at, uh, at uh, Columbia, and that's why he was wanted. Uh, and Montgomery Clift was sort of a, an iconoclast, I guess you could say, in the Hollywood system. He generally, I, I just read a biography about Montgomery Clift, so I'm full of facts about him. I will not share the you know salacious details of his life, which the, but, <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, I will say, I, we, 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 this is a clean podcast, it's a clean show, but uh, I will say that uh, it was sort of assumed that he was a homosexual. Uh, he was not. In fact, he was bisexual, which in the 50s is basically the same thing uh, as, as far as most people were concerned at the time. Um, but uh, he, uh, he was... Uh, uh, he and Elizabeth Taylor were very close, and the book sort of hints that maybe they had an affair. Elizabeth Taylor wanted Montgomery Cliff to marry her, but he wouldn't. Uh, he, he was, he's sort of a tragic figure uh, in Hollywood in a lot of ways. Um, he, uh, he was uh, an alcoholic. He was addicted to all sorts of pills, even while this film was being shot. Uh, he started off on Broadway, and uh, this was in the era of when you know you didn't do Broadway when you had become a star and now you want to do something else. Broadway's where you became a star. You know he was he was on stage with Orson Welles and um, uh, Joseph Cotton and sort of that crowd coming in. Um, this is still in the days when you could just be on Broadway and be a big star mm -hmm. just from being on Broadway. Um, it's not the, the same anymore. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so he was, uh, you know, and he the, about five years after this was when he had his sort of horrific car accident that um, uh, basically he had to they had to rebuild his face. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I haven't gotten that far in the book yet. <laughs> well, Cl Clift was kind of like with Marlon Brando, part of this new wave of method actors. Yeah. And his first film, his first major film was Red River with John Wayne. His last film was The Misfits with Clark Gable. Yeah. And it's funny, in interviews with Wayne, Gable, Burt Lancaster, they all said they were terrified of working with Montgomery Clift because of his intensity, essentially staying yeah. in character off camera. And if you look at all those films, all those actors give some of their best performances because he really kind of yeah. raised their game. Yeah. Um, another actor that came in right after Montgomery Clift, and you can almost see Montgomery Clift as sort of like almost the, you, you can understand why this particular actor loved him so much, and that actor was James Dean. Uh, yeah. James Dean was a huge Montgomery Clift fan, loved him uh, a lot. And in fact, even watching this movie, you almost feel like if James Dean had been in that movie, you would have felt like that makes a lot of sense. Right. Um, but, but yeah, he and Marlon Brando did not get along. <laughs> but reading that book, it seems like Montgomery Clift really didn't get along with anyone. Really, Probably. even uh, even the people who like said, "Oh, we're really good friends with Montgomery Clift," they didn't really say a lot of nice things about him. Um, but uh, but he he was that actor who who you know took it very very seriously, and uh, uh, he always had his acting coach with him on set, which directors hated uh, because they would say, "All right, let's go on to the next scene," and he would look at his acting coach, and she would be like. And he would be like, we're going to do that again. Um, so it was always very difficult, apparently, to, uh, to have him on set. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And let's talk about Lancaster a bit, because I, he's like the classic 50s male, uh, especially in this film. It's almost like, uh, you know, he, uh, if, they, if they made Mad Men in that time, like there's only one person who could have played Don Draper in the 50s, and it, and it was Burt Lancaster. You know, it would have he would have just slotted right in, and it would have still been a great show. Um, but what I find interesting about his character is that, and also just about the film is that, we get to the point where we're realizing, oh, Pearl Harbor's about to happen, and that's when the movie gets you know kind of really interesting because it's like, these are not seasoned soldiers. In fact, I think the only soldier that, the only real soldier, the person who's been in combat that we sort of hear about is Lancaster. Because mm -hmm. um, they said something about, oh, I even heard about him in the Philippines because he's mm -hmm. such a great soldier. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I love Lancaster in this film. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, the only thing, problem I have with him in the film is they make a big deal about him not being officer material. And he clearly is. Yeah. <laughs> he's clearly a born leader. And uh, he, he was such a great actor and probably one of the most 
physical actors in probably the history of movies and very versatile. Uh, next month, they're going to show The Leopard here on the screen. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen that, if you want to get an idea of Lancaster's versatility, check that out because he plays a 19th century Italian aristocrat in that film. Hmm. And uh, just, uh, yeah, just a fantastic actor. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of Lancaster films at the cinema, and I don't know off the top of my head if I'd ever seen a Lancaster film before uh, the cinema came around, but we've had uh, Sweet Smell of Success here. We've had The Train. Mm -hmm. There was another one, there was another Lancaster film, but he, it's just kind of hard to get away from him in this era because mm -hmm. he really was that big a deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, early, you know, I, I take notes when I'm you know, preparing for things like this, and I can continue to do that during the movie. And one thing that I noticed, and you kind of touched on just a little bit, is that as the sort of Pearl Harbor, you know, uh, attack is coming, you, you sort of start seeing that use of the calendar. And early yeah. on, you sort of, you know, you see it in the background, and then there's the obvious shot, you know, you know, December yeah. 7th, it's they, right there. Yeah, they, at the start of the movie, it says it's 1941, and then there's the character who says, hey, December 15th, you can still help us win the championship. Right. And it's like, yeah. And it was interesting to see how many people reacted to that, oh, yeah. you know, with the gasp, like, oh, it's, you know, that's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's going to happen, you know, yeah. and, that, and that was is really cool. And that's what is so great about, you know, watching movies here at the cinema is that you get that feeling because, you know, in your head, you may just think that you may not actually vocalize it to, you know, either yourself or whomever you're watching it with. Yeah. But it's nice to get that feeling like sort of like, OK, yeah, that shot works because he clear, you know, he clearly like leans into the wall and it's like. Yeah, it's very. And then then and they didn't it, zoom in. I don't know of any other way of doing it. I mean, th then it gets really like way more obvious a little bit later, where it's like the uh, you know the he walks sign. by the sign. And it's yeah. like the sign Pearl Harbor, eight miles, and it's like all right, movie, we get it, we get it. I mean, that counts as subtle nowadays, but like you know, nowadays you'd have like characters walking around being like, hey, are we going to Pearl Harbor this weekend? Yeah, I think so. It's December sixth. So it'll be great, you know. <laughs> I'm sure there won't be any attacks. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's what would happen in a movie made today. Yeah. Um, the other interesting casting uh, thing is that the original choice to play um, uh, the captain's wife uh, was um, Joan Crawford. Mm. Um, now, I've heard two stories about this, so I'll, I'll share them both, and we'll see if I don't know if either of them are true. Uh, but the first story I heard is that Joan Crawford... Uh, was cast, and then she got into a dispute with the costume designer and quit, which I sort of buy because it sounds that like a very me. Joan Crawford thing to yeah. do. Um, the other one that I heard was that the directors and the producers wanted to cast against type mm -hmm. because everyone would like buy, oh, well, sure, Joan Crawford would play a character that would cheat on her husband, but Deborah Kerr was right. a little bit different, you know? Mm -hmm. She was like sort of more wholesome, I guess, and they wanted to, to cast against type. Yeah, well, De Deborah Carr was known as a very prim and proper actress. Uh, one of the movies she made right before this was Black Narcissus, where she played a nun. Yeah. So, uh, but, but yeah, th that's the story I heard as well, that Zinnemann, in many of these performances, wanted to cast against type, because if he had cast a sex pot in the role, there'd be no suspense. But with Deborah Carr, it's kind of like, well, let's, let's sort of see what happens. Yeah. And uh, Sinatra. Mm -hmm. How did Sinatra get cast? <laughs> well, not by putting a horse's head in <laughs> Harry Cohen, the studio right. head's bed, yeah. according to legend. But yeah. uh, well, I heard uh, his wife, Ava Gardner, at the time was making a movie on, with the same studio, and she pushed Sinatra to Harry Cohen, who was a studio head. And Sinatra essentially had to pay his way to the screen test and essentially work for the equivalent to minimum wage at the time. Yeah, $8,000 yeah. is yeah. what what the what's the story is. But yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's the apocryphal. This is where, by the way, if you didn't sort of catch the reference, uh, the, the story about in The Godfather where the horse's head goes in, this was, that was sort of the legend was that that was Frank Sinatra. Uh, and he was the one who had mob connections, and that's how he got into that movie. Um, Probably, we're, we're guessing it's not true. Probably not. Yeah. It's a good story. Probably apocryphal. But, uh, and also the, uh, the scene where he rolls the olives and hits snake eyes, that was his screen test. And he, he ad-libbed that scene, and Zinnemann loved it so much that they, they kept it in yeah. the movie. Yeah. And I, I, love, um, I love Sinatra in this film. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is the film where like, you know, Sinatra was such a great actor. He was almost like a victim of his fame. Mm -hmm. I feel like nobody took him seriously as an actor because he was so famous as a, a singer. Um, but this is the film that I think you, you cannot convince me that Sinatra is not a great actor because this is one of like the coolest people of his generation. And he plays kind of a loser. He does, yeah. He kind of plays the, the, the opposite of, you know, the, the um, Montgomery Clift character. And then they almost sort of work off of each other. Yeah. Like, you know, one, one is stronger, one's picking the other one up, and one's sort of supporting, like, rah, 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 you, you know, you keep going. Yeah. And so it's interesting to see that contrast. And then, of course, later on in the movie, um, Burt Lancaster kind of picks up that role mm -hmm. since Sinatra's character obviously isn't around. He kind of does that in a more leadership kind of way, obviously, sort of sweeping things under the rug. Yeah. You know, and, and sort of sharing a drink with him. That's, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. And then sitting in the middle of the road, <laughs> uh, you know, that, yeah. that's kind of strange. But There's also kind of a duality between, I hadn't picked up on the duality between, um, you know, uh, Pruitt and Maggio, but there was another duality between the, the two couples mm -hmm. in the film where yeah. there is, you know, Lancaster is trying to sort of get out of this a little bit and Pruitt is trying to get into it and the women are playing opposite roles essentially. Um, and I thought Donna Reed was amazing in this as well. Like this is well before, um, this is after, is this after, uh, this is after uh, It's a Wonderful Life, mm -hmm. but before the Donna Reed show. So she had, uh, she had, she was known, but not, I don't know if, how big a star she was at the time, but um, also she was not the director's choice. She was the studio head's choice. And the only reason she got cast was because uh, he, uh, the director felt like he had to give in on that one because he had worked so hard. He, Fred Zinnemann actually threatened to quit the film uh, if Montgomery Clift was not cast. Uh, so uh, he felt like he had to let, let that one go. Well, one of the interesting things, you know, of course you already noted on it, and it's something that I wrote down is I wrote down the phrase, giving up one's belief for love. And you see that. You see that Pruitt's character, obviously he's just like, no, I, I will not box, you know, I will not give in. And then as soon as there's an opportunity for him to, you know, to get with, you know, the, the, the woman, he's like, okay, yeah, I'll box, I'll do whatever it takes to do it. And then obviously Burt Lancaster is just yeah. like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. When he has a clear opportunity yeah. to take it. And it's so interesting. All he has to do is sign a piece of paper. Right. And uh, go sit behind a desk and get whatever he wants in his personal life. Yeah. And so it's very interesting to see those two contrast. And then, of course, you know, it's not just the, the guys that are sort of contrasting one another. It's also the women. And, and you see that in um, Donna Reed's character where you can tell that, you know, you hear that she got hurt. You know, she moved to, you know, Hawaii basically to get away from this guy who she was with for, what, three years? And then he just was like, I'm going to get married, you know to this other girl so that my parents are happy or you know whatever the excuse is. And you can tell in that scene that she's really hurt. Um, I can't remember, I wrote it down. She says, um, oh, if you're proper, you're safe. She says that and, I, yeah. and I'm just like, man, that's like, that's pretty deep. Yeah. She's going to a, a place where she's still hurt. I mean, she's still running away. Yeah. And obviously um, Montgomery Clift is, or, or Pruitt in this case, is, is suffering because of that. Like, he didn't do anything. Yeah. All he wants to do is love her, yeah. but she's just not letting him in. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting thing. That's a very 50s sensibility. Like, if this movie was made in the late 60s, I don't know if you could have, if, if people would have, like, bought that, that somebody just wanted to go and, that a woman just wanted to go and be normal and just raise proper kids and be Donna Reed. That's what she wanted. That's what that character wanted to be. She wanted to be Donna Reed. Yeah. Well, one of the things that was tidied up from the novel is in the novel, Lorene, the Donna Reed character, is a prostitute. Yeah. And so in the movie, obviously, that's not going to get past the censors. So they turn it into a social club, mm. um, <laughs> which is sort of a you know a thinly veiled version of the same thing. But they yeah. got free sodas. That's yeah. true. <laughs> There can't be any sex happening in a club with free soda. <laughs> Just not true. Not going to happen. I mean, for four dollars. Yeah, four bucks sounds like two bucks a month. That's a good deal. That's good a good soda. deal. All the soda you can drink. Um, <laughs> okay. Anyone? Anyone have a, a comment? Want to throw something out? I got. I got a guy right here. I thought it was something uh, that the army guys were so old. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, was it really like that? That I don't know, but it seems like before Pearl Harbor, before World War II, our fighting force was certainly not what it has become. So I would, I would believe that, that guys just were able to hang around the army for all time because it was all, 
And then and the, and the idea of a 30 year man too is yeah. kind of interesting. So. Yeah. This is this right here. Well, to the same point, um, the, the, the age, if you were casting that today with people who have been after Vietnam, Mm. And currently, you'd, you, you would have probably seen a younger looking army would have been expected. Uh, in, in my era, you had just come out of the Depression for the casting of that in, in real time. And uh, a number of people would have loved to be in the army after the CCC. They came out of the civilian corps building, building things oh, yeah. for the government. An army job was a good job. And there were a lot of people who would be in 30 years like that. Yeah. Uh, one of them would have been my uncle. Huh. Then after that uh, Pearl Harbor, many of them became Mustangs. Mm. And they were given commissions because they had the most experience and would have finished up uh, with, a, with a quick battlefield commission. Uh, I think if you recall, Dwight Eisenhower had, had his rank dropped all the way back to captain yeah. by that time. <laughs> And so they, they filled the ranks very quickly. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's an important point in this film uh, that, again, like this is not a seasoned army. This is not, they are not ready for what's happening to them. Well, and of course, you get the, you know, uh, Lancaster gives the order, like, you know, stay in your bunk. And I kind of think he was saying, like, I don't trust you with a gun yeah. out there. <laughs> well, that's the thing he says to, to, to Maggio as well. He's like, if you saw a dead body, you'd soil yourself. It's like, these are not men who've seen combat, you know? These are, these are guys who, again, probably joined the army because it was a good job. And we're not going to get into a war. <laughs> who, how can we get into a war? But, of course, the only one that's saying that is Lancaster. Yeah. You know, he's like, oh, well, you know, months from now, we could be in a war and, you know— yeah, I'm trying to be with you at the same time, and I don't mm -hmm. want to be sitting behind a desk. And it's just it's kind of weird, yeah. In that yeah. sense, so I want to talk about that last scene because I'm 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 maybe it's obvious to everyone else, but I'm still trying to, to wrap my head around the scene with uh, with Donna Reed and uh, Deborah Kerr at the very end when uh, Deborah uh, Donna Reed is saying that Pruitt was a bomber pilot and uh, you know all that stuff. So he, she has the uh, the trumpet uh, thing. Which uh, was given, which was held by uh, Burt Lancaster's character. So, did he go to her and make up this story? Did he? What? what how did he? I, I'm, I'm very confused by that theory. I think she made it up. She I'm made under it the up. Impression that you know she's just making it up, so it makes it seem like you know she's going back with this story okay. that she can tell people, and you know because, like I said, getting back to what she was saying before. Trying to be proper, trying yeah. to trying to do you know what's best, and of course that's going to give her you know sympathy when she returns. I'm just under the impression that she just made up that story with just a little bit <laughs> of truth in it. Yeah, well that makes that makes a lot of sense because you're right. She did sort of want to be proper. She wanted she want to have a good story to tell. She's not she doesn't want people to know that she worked at this Congress club. Well, and she calls she calls him her fiance. That's true as well. Yeah, and that's never really confirmed yeah. until then it's just like well the guy had to die before you know he got engaged that's kind of yeah awful <laughs> any other comments out here about that about the ending i got one right here hold off for the, with the mic there be like they were actually using footage from the pearl harbor oh, yeah. attack was mm -hmm. that correct yes i yeah. thought i recognized yeah that, that, that's such. one thing that's really interesting about the directors of course he uses a lot of sort of practical sets and you see that like he uses the beach and um the the army barracks and stuff like that but then of course you're, you're not going to get away with sort of reenacting i mean I, I was blown away how many shots of airplanes near the barracks were used mm -hmm. and then but it seemed very obvious to me that yes there was a lot of footage used from pearl harbor of course you know model sets enough movies were being made about world war ii especially pearl harbor that i wouldn't be surprised if some of that was stock footage from other movies yeah you know used at the same time yeah but in the that I don't know. I don't know who did that. Um, I don't. I don't know if there was. Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, we know he was dubbed, uh, but I don't know if it was anyone well known enough to. Yep. Yes, <laughs> excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, and uh, Montgomery Cliff practiced for months to to do this, and 
even though they had told him in advance that he was not going to be playing the bugle in the film. Uh, they, he knew, he knew as he was practicing this, but what he wanted, he wanted to get the mouth movements right and the breath movements and the throat movements and all that. He wanted that to be accurate. Yeah. This was the kind of guy that Montgomery Clift was. Well, he helped make it a very convincing dub, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he really, he really got into it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, this is just such a complex movie. I want to talk about how... I have a theory about why the beach scene is the only piece of footage you ever see from this movie. Because there's a lot of good stuff in this film. Um, but I think that it's so complex that you just... Seeing a guy play taps is like, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. Because so much has led up to that moment. Um, well, it's a sobering movie too. Yeah, which is which is funny if you you know using that term because everybody's drinking so <laughs> yes. much. This but is it is, it really is, and it's not until sort of that tap scene that you don't really come around yeah. to realizing that you know it's things are about to get pretty serious. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thanks to the magic of Google and Wikipedia, I found out that the trumpet player was named Manny Klein. Manny Klein. And uh, interesting note about him, he also did the trumpet for the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly theme. So, oh, okay. Interesting. All right. So he was a Hollywood guy, then, it sounds like. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's talk about the boxing. Did you guys notice Claude Aikens in there? Yeah. Just snuck in? <laughs> I, I, there was there was a several character actors in the background. The first time I saw this, I, w I would have sworn that it was Robert Duvall playing one of the parts. It's not Robert Duvall. It's a guy that sort of looks like a young Robert Duvall, and he's actually a, 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 a pretty well-versed character actor. I just can't remember his name. Um, if he, he's one of the guys that helps that, that's on um, that's on. Um, Pruitt's side oh, that sort of helps him out. Jack Warden, as I hear talking uh, that, about. It might be Jack Warden. He's there, yeah. He's been um, in a lot of stuff. Also, George Reeves, who was the original Superman, has a, a brief role in yeah. there as well. Yeah. Do you know, because uh -huh. I've heard that several times, and I have no idea who he plays. I, I could be wrong. You can look it up. <laughs> I think he played, does he play Stark? Um, that's that's uh, the character, uh, I just don't remember. Yeah, I'm okay. blank. I think, uh, you know, just... Looking at the, the yeah. cast, I think that's the, maybe the name that's right. associated with him. Okay. Yeah. I still don't know who that is, but okay. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, yeah. Um, so let's talk about Borgnine. We haven't talked about Borgnine yet. Um, what an unseemly guy. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of terms I could use to describe him, but again, this is a, this is a clean show. So... Uh, uh, I, I heard every. I heard you react. I heard you react when Sinatra comes up on him with a stool and just bam, just, oh, he just hits knocks him. him in the head. Is great. I know. Mm. That's that's the kind of stuff you could do in old Hollywood. I don't know if you could if you could do a shot like that. Well, it'd be nowadays. digital. It'd be a digital yeah. stool. You know, yeah. hitting somebody in the face. Yeah. Oh wow! I'd right love on the that. top of the head, I think actually. Yeah. Just, yeah. I don't even I mean, know if must... they had to dub that sound. It must have just been so real. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the other thing, uh, that scene with Montgomery Clift and Ernest Borgnine, they actually, um, with that one, they, uh, they, what I read was that scene took, that like little two and a half minute scene took uh, 12 hours to shoot. Um, and apparently they were, they were doing that. I mean, they were both covered in bruises from head to toe from, mm -hmm. from doing that scene because they do it and say, we can do that better. And they try it again and they were really hitting each other. You know, you see their faces that whole time. Yeah. There's no, the only thing that's hidden is when they sort of fall behind the trash cans. Yeah, all the fight scenes are really well choreographed, I thought, in the film. And uh, although it's interesting for a movie that talks a lot about boxing, we never actually get into the ring. <laughs> yeah. The one big fight is, uh, yeah. you know, the uh, the illegal one, I guess. But uh, yeah, yeah what I love about Borgnine, he's kind of the original master of jocular menace. <laughs> where um, and, and he played a lot of bad guys in his career, Bad Day at Black Rock and um, The Wild Bunch. Although uh, two years after this, he won the Oscar for Marty. Uh, in 1955, yeah. which was uh, a, a change of pace for him for his career. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any other comments out in the crowd? All right. I got one more down here. <laughs> well, uh, one thing that I thought was really cool in the movie was the cinematography. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't watch very many black and white movies. It's just mm -hmm. not my pace. But like, I really liked the 
the shots in the movie, and I, I didn't even feel like I was watching a black and white movie. It, yeah. was, it was really nice. And uh, one scene in particular where Burt Lancaster was talking to Deborah Carr, and um, she like turned to face him, but the sun was in her eyes. I thought that was brilliant yeah. because like I I actually saw like the sunlight, and it it just it, I don't know. It really stuck out to me as yeah. something that would be it would be totally different in a color movie. And just absolutely, it's interesting. Yeah. So right behind you there. That scene also reminded me, if you notice the way they had her do it, she was saluting him. That's true. Yeah. Because the way she's holding her hand up like that, it's a salute. And then when she realizes that it is over, she drops the salute and turns to go. And then we see Pearl Harbor's eight miles away. Yeah. yeah. But it, w it was a salute. Very, very interesting. I did not, I did not, I did not catch yeah. that. One of the things that I really liked was, I don't know how many people heard it, you definitely probably don't notice it at the beginning if this is the first time you've watched the movie, but uh, since this was like the second or third time I've watched the movie in the last two weeks. By the way, <laughs> another note, I was going to try to watch this movie, basically do this blind where I would just watch this movie tonight and see if I could get to make an interesting conversation. But I realized that would be a fun experiment for me, not so much for the people who were nice enough to stick around for the show. So I didn't do that. I watched that a couple times. But uh, the the strands of uh, re-enlistment blues mm -hmm. is, is woven into the score, uh, especially in uh, important parts of the film. So the first, as, as uh, Pruitt is walking up to the base during the opening credits, if you listen closely, you can hear the... Da, na, 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 na. Just it right woven into like the orchestral score, which I really, I really I enjoy never that. I picked up on that, but yeah, yeah I, I, you, you must be right because it's also used at the very end of the film, yeah, in a very sort of ominous manner. And then, of course, when Pruitt gets shot, it's like very obvious that you know, then it like sort of picks up, and yeah. The, I guess the vocals roll in, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's it, that's interesting. I didn't realize it was used at the very beginning, yeah. Um, did we talk about the book at all? No, we have not. The book. This <laughs> film is based on a book uh, by a guy named James Jones, who I, I don't know a ton about, but I know he was in the Army, and he was stationed in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he was there during Pearl Harbor or if it was like he just sort of imagined what it would have been like, but he was stationed in Hawaii for a time. Yeah. Well, uh, James Jones also wrote Some Came Running, which became another Sinatra movie, and The Thin Red Line which was, became the Terrence Malick film back in the late 90s. And uh, I was actually, my, my goal for the week was I was going to read From Here to Eternity, <laughs> and I got the book, and it's over 900 pages long. <laughs> so, I, But I read about a third of it, and it's, it's a really excellent yeah. book. Um, it came out in 1951, very scandalous, controversial book, for, I, I, I think for two reasons. Number one is because it's very frank in its depiction of alcoholism, adultery, um, prostitution, uh, even even homosexuality is in the book. And the second reason why I think it was so controversial is because Jones does not pass judgment on any of these things. He, he does not you know, condemn, which of course was not going to fly by the Hollywood censors Absolutely. at the time. Uh, yeah, so, you know, watching this movie, it kind of reminds me of the difference between how movies are adapted today compared to then. Today, if you have a 300 page book like The Hobbit, it's going to be bloated into a <laughs> nine hour a movie. Have Here no we idea. have a 900 page book distilled into a two hour movie. Yeah. And it's it's an excellent adaptation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, always, it's always interesting because um, it's sort of a, a book around the same type of uh, period, The Naked and the Dead. The Norman Mailer, uh, I don't think it's ever been adapted to a, uh, an actual movie so, before. Yeah. So I'd be interested, you know, it's, it's interesting, like you make that really valid point that a book that is that sort of epic, it was just one movie. Yeah, and the uh, Harry Cohen purchased the book before getting the approval of the army to make it. So it was known as Cohen's Folly throughout Hollywood until they let Dan Teradash, who was a screenwriter, take a crack at it, and they were, they were really impressed. Well, yeah, and he was, he was also a, a, yeah. in the Army during World War II, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that, that yeah. probably helped. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and there's that scene, and I don't know if it felt off to anyone else with the rest of the film, but there's that scene where uh, uh, Holmes is being reprimanded. Completely, the, the least convincing scene. Yeah, yeah. What, what, I, <laughs> what I read about it was that Zinnemann basically felt like he was making a, an army propaganda film. Like, mm -hmm. cause literally it's like, you sir, you're a dastardly 
sky, and you sh didn't shouldn't have forgotten that the first goal is to make the men happy. And it's like, oh, uh, I can't believe they're doing this. All but. that was lacking was him just turning to the camera. And, <laughs> yeah, and it's saying, like, and buy yeah. war bonds. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a terrible, terrible scene. But yeah. I but that was the compromise. At yes, the end of if you have to have that scene in there for the rest of that movie, I will. I'll let it go. I'll let it go. Any last comments from the audience? I think we're just about ready to, to finish up. All right, let's get out of here. Uh, Craig, thank you so much for sitting down with thank us. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for sticking around. I really appreciate it. Uh, Jason, uh, well, I'm Andy. And I'm Jason. This has been, and always will be, a place for film. Good night, guys. Thanks. Thank you. A Place for Film is recorded at WFIU Studios in Bloomington, Indiana.